Hello, welcome to Locked on Sharks, the premier hockey podcast of your favorite team in the Bay Area. And on today's episode, we are joined by the voice of the San Jose Barracuda, Nick Nolenberger. We're going to talk about the season that was, uh, kind of a little peek ahead into next season, and, and some rapid fire questions uh, about Nick's experience this year with uh, covering the Barracuda. So, all that and more on today's episode of Locked on Sharks. Your Locked On Sharks, your daily podcast on the San Jose Sharks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, J.D. Young, contributor at San Jose Hockey Now. I want to thank you for making Locked On Sharks your first listen. Uh, proudly a part of the Locked On Network, where we cover your team every day. And if you want to be an everydayer, all you have to do is subscribe or follow for free wherever you get podcasts, or you can watch on YouTube as well. And this week, we kick off CUDA Week. Uh, we're going to be diving into the Barracuda season that was in from the 2022-2023 season and start peeking ahead uh, into next year and how why this Barracuda team should be a much better team in year, kind of year two under this new regime. So uh, Nick Nolenberger, of course, joins uh, always a treat when Nick joins to talk about us uh, talk with us so um, before we get into our conversation uh, with Nick do want to let you guys know that today's episode is brought to you guys by game time download the game time app create an account and use code uh, locked on NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase and now we bring in the voice the busiest man in San Jose, uh, Nick, Nol- the voice of the Barracuda, sorry, the busiest man in San Jose, Nick Nolenberger. Uh, Nick, how's it going, buddy? It's going great. I'm not as busy right now. So, you know, we're we're in full off-season mode. We were just talking <laughs> off-air, um, watching a lot of hockey, but it's a little different when you aren't prepping for it. You, you can just watch it as a casual fan. So, um, yeah, the schedule is thinned out a little bit, which is uh, always good to recharge the batteries, but... You know, October will be here before we know it. The draft will be here. Development camp, everything that goes into to a normal off season uh, nowadays. So we'll be back at the at the rink on a regular basis. But uh, things are good. Thank you for having me. Uh, thanks for coming on. So we're gonna be, like I said, we're gonna be kicking off Barracuda Week. Uh, we're gonna be diving into the Barracuda, uh, and I thought no better person than the actual voice of the Barracuda. Um, so let's start with this. How would you sum up this past season for the Barracuda, the 2022-2023 season? What what word or what's the best way you would describe to sum up this season? I think everybody hoped to get in the playoffs, and that was kind of the one disappointing uh, end mm-hmm. to it all. But overall, I, I I would say it was a success. Just we'll we'll start off the ice, I guess, if you will, from a fan standpoint, from a support standpoint, some of our best games came down the final stretch. Um, and I don't think it had much to do with the fact the team was in a playoff race. I just think momentum started to get built and we're still growing. I was just talking to someone about this. We're still growing the team. We're still growing the brand. We're still educating on what the AHL is. We've got a great group of fans, but there's more fans out there that are still unfamiliar with our product and, and what we have to offer. So it was a really encouraging end, I thought, from a fan support standpoint. We had great crowds down the final stretch. Um, on the ice, obviously, again, disappointing not to make the playoffs. That was something that was uh, mm-hmm. pretty evident from the coaching staff and and from the luminaries. That was a goal going into this year was to get into the playoffs because there's just nothing that mimics playoff hockey except when players are thrust into – into what is, you know, the high intensity of playoff hockey. We've seen it in the NHL playoffs. We're seeing it in the Calder Cup playoffs right now. It's just more intense. There's less space, quicker decision-making. Everything that goes into playoff hockey makes it so great. I really feel like it it can help accelerate the development for players and just give guys experience that uh, cannot be mimicked in the regular season. So that was overall disappointing. As a collective group, there was tons of positives, right? I mean, we had a, a huge group of young players, as we often see an influx of young guys coming in every year. And we saw growth from guys. We saw uh, inconsistencies, I guess, if you will, at times. But that's part of it, right? That's part of the learning curve is you're going to have ebbs and flows. You're going to have points in a, in a season. It's a long, grueling season where you have bumps and bruises and all of a sudden nothing goes in. 
You can't get anything to fall in your favor, and then you see it before your eyes, a player breakthrough. Um, just a guy who comes to mind, uh, uh, Tristan Robbins, for an example. Mm-hmm. He had a stretch of 10 to 15 games where he was pretty quiet, and then all of a sudden he just kind of broke through that wall and finished really strong. So those are the type of things that you look for. When did they hit the wall? Are they able to get beyond the wall? And how do you go into the end of the year pulling out some of the positives and kind of giving you a glimpse on what to expect maybe the the following year? So, you know, there was a lot of uh, exciting things that happened this year. It starts with the building, but that mix of of young players and and where they finished. Um, Daniil Gushin was obviously a guy that everybody was talking about at the end of the year, just the way he was playing. You saw growth really before your eyes. It was it was tangible, his growth at the end of the year. So, um, you know, overall, you would have loved to get into the playoffs, but I'd say this year was a success given the fact that you had so much change, so many new players. You've got a new GM in the organization. You've got new coaching staff with the Sharks and with the Barracuda. Um, overall, I, I thought it was a success at the HL level. All right. I mean, we know, of course, about the young players, but uh, actually I want to start with the veterans. So... Guys like Andrew Agazzino and Derek Pugliot, who I think kind of really stepped in and, and added a lot of a lot to this team. What, how important do you think their additions were in the offseason? I think very quiet additions by Mike Greer and Joe Will. But then, I, you know, you look at those two guys and kind of some of the most important pieces for this Barracuda team. How important do you think they were for this team? Yeah, they were. I mean, they were critical. Um the AHL is younger than it's ever been. You go back a decade plus, and it was a much older league. Same thing with the NHL. You know, with with a flat cap, you, you've got to play young guys earlier than maybe you'd like, and you need them to produce earlier than maybe you normally would in the past. The same thing is going to happen in the AHL. You've got a ton of young guys. But I don't believe you win or have much in the way of success from a win-loss standpoint unless you've got veteran players who not only are great in the locker room and they're going to show the way for these young guys, but they've got to produce. And Agazino was a great example of that. Basically led the way from wire to wire as the team's leading offensive producer. Um, played in all situations. This is a guy who's been around for quite some time, over 10 years at the professional level. Um, the way he approached each day was a, a – great example for all these young players but again the fact that he was able to produce and the same thing can be said for Derek Pouliot uh the back end was thin it was yes. <laughs> it was thin I mean to be honest there wasn't a ton of highly touted prospects on the on the blue line this past year so you really relied on guys like Pouliot um you know other guys had to step up as well we you know we saw at the end of the year some guys playing heavy minutes that were not on the team at the start of the year. And uh, at one point, we're on PTOs. Darren Brady comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Um, Dell, same situation, but had to play a little bit up at forward. So you relied on guys who maybe you didn't even expect to be in the conversation at the start of the year. But Pouliot, when he missed a month plus in the season, I mean, that's where you can circle as uh, the point which the Barracuda fell out of the playoff race, at least – they fell behind the eight ball so far that they just couldn't get back into it. And they were kind of trying to dig their way out once Pouliot came back into the lineup. But his absence was um, was critical in, in what turned out to be a tough stretch of games. I think they lost, um, you know, if memory serves me correct, there was a stretch in December where it was something like six to eight games or, or something like that in which they, they lost consecutively. And you just can't have stretches like that if you want to be a playoff team. Um, there's a lot of teams that make the playoffs now in the Pacific Division in the AHL. Um, but you just cannot have lapses like that. And for whatever reason, the team just lacked consistency. Uh, they won their first four games of the year. They did not do that again all season long. I think they won three uh, in a row just a couple of times. So there was a win one, lose one, win two, lose two type of situation all season long. So um, to circle back on your question, yeah, the impact of a guy like Pouliot and Agazina was critical. Again, the team didn't make the playoffs, but you just wonder where they'd be without those guys. You, you've got to have a blend of young prospects, but guys who have been there and done that. All right, guys, before we continue our conversation with Nick, we start to look ahead for the next season, kind of what the Barracuda need to work on the most. Um, Spoiler, it's penalties. Um, And, you know, just kind of talk about year two under John McCarthy and this new regime and what the expectation is for the Barracuda. Do need to take a break. Uh, Talk to you guys about our friends over at Athletic Greens. 
Today's episode is brought to you by a product that my wife uses literally every day, AG1 by Athletic Greens. Um, maybe you want to be healthy and eat well, but it's always easier said than done, and that's no longer the case with AG1. With one delicious scoop of AG1 in a glass of water you're, each day, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens to help start your day right. The special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, all the things. It can be hard and expensive to keep track of multiple different supplements and vitamins, not to mention how hard it can be on your stomach. AG1 costs less than $3 a day. You're investing in your health and it's cheaper than your cold brew habit. So right now it is time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with a convenient daily nutrition. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of their immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs to be the first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right. And then uh, I want to, you kind of mentioned the coaching staff, right? Um, the growth of, especially a rookie coaching staff, right? John McCarthy, rookie head coach, you know, the assistant coaches, their first year in the AHL. Um, what do you think kind of seeing their growth and development from day one to the end of the season with this team, like how important and going forward, right. Learning kind of all those rookie mistakes for coaches, how, how big is that for them? Yeah. You know, there's no way in any field and you can talk about broadcasting or, or coaching or being a player mm -hmm. with, there's certain things you just cannot learn without doing it. And yep. uh, I think for the coaching staff and just the, kind of the tone in, in some of our conversations, both myself and John McCarthy, as the season continued along, you know, for, for J-Mac, it was very, I would say, X's and O's earlier, early in the year, implementing systems, really driving home how the organization wants guys to play from a night in and night out basis. And then as the season continued along, I noticed a little bit of a shift just in his philosophy that sometimes you've just got to go on the ice and it's a matter of will. Um, it isn't always going to be predicated on systems and playing within the system. Sometimes guys got to go out there and just compete and put it out on the line and, and see where the chips fall, uh, if you will. So I, I kind of noticed that with, with J-Mac down the final stretch. Um, mm -hmm. you know, he's trying to get his team into the playoffs and trying to motivate, but at the same time, he's hoping the guys motivate themselves uh, when they're in this playoff race. So um I saw that was something that really stuck out to me with, with J-Mac and his kind of evolution as the season continued along. Overall, from a coaching standpoint, I, I thought they did a just a, an excellent job. I mean, we talked about the blue line very thin on the back end. Um, that didn't change really all year long. You've got so many young players, 10-plus rookies on this team, um, an average age under 23. You're, you're one of the youngest teams in the league all year long. You dealt with a lot of different injuries. Um, some of the veterans we alluded to, Pouliot was out for a good chunk of time. Uh, Magazino missed some games with an upper body injury. CJ Cease missed some time as well. Um, so there was an impact from a health standpoint. Everybody deals with it. But um, overall, I thought they did a great job. And, you know, they, they were as disappointed, the coaching staff, as anybody not to get into the playoffs. But, you know, this is a this is a, a situation in the American Hockey League where you're balancing development and results and it's always going to be uh, a balance and I think for the for the coaches they were learning that as they went along but um, you know overall the guys love playing for them um, mm -hmm. I, I felt like you know there was a, a, a mutual respect uh, among the players and the coaches for the way that they were treated um, and overall for, for what the season handed uh, to this group as a whole I thought the coaches uh, just did a great job I mean yeah you know Coach McCarthy, his background is developing, right? Developing, developing. And you could see that. You, you touched on guys like Gushin and Robbins and where you can kind of see that, especially that second half of the season where that stuff starts to click in with those guys. And you saw those guys kind of really take a next level and the next step. You know, Gushin, I think, especially, right, where where you see saw his game become more – uh, well developed and well rounded type of game from from a guy like Daniel Gushin. So, heading into next year, how important do you think um, it is for guys like Robbins and Gushin and Co. and Wiseblad who are going to be second year pros? How much of a jump should we expect to see from these guys as they've kind of gone through the rigors of a full AHL season, know what to expect, and then kind of get ready for for year two? I don't know if um, it's tough to always put. A, I guess a measuring stick on on how far mm -hmm. uh, 
they will improve. But you do expect from year one to year two to always see some sort of growth. And a lot of that comes from reflection. And I think from the year as a whole, trial and error and experience, all that goes into it. You go into the offseason, you you talk to the the front office and the coaching staff as part of your exit meetings. They're going to tell you all the things you did well, all the things that they want you to improve. And then you've got a full summer to go into the gym. Uh, for a lot of these players, they're young, right? They're still trying yeah. to add weight, still trying to build their bodies. Um, and so the offseason really affords the opportunity to go in the gym and add that weight and really kind of fine tune different areas. During the season, these guys, you know, they work out in the gym, but it's much lighter. Um, it's yep. kind of to deal with the rigors of the season. It's a lot about rehab, a lot about, you know, staying healthy and, and mending their bodies. You go into the off season, you get 100% healthy, you dive into the gym, and you see huge growth from a physical standpoint quite often with these guys. You at least hope so when mm -hmm. they come back for development camp and for training camp. So it's always interesting to see who really utilized the time in the off season. Um, but you sh certainly should expect a big jump for these guys, given the fact that they've got a full year now under their belt. And we'll see how things shake out in training camp. There's always kind of a surprise player in training camp. Maybe it's one of these guys. Maybe it's somebody who comes in. Um, but it, it certainly sets uh, the stage going into training camp when you've got this group of young players who's going to kind of grab the bull by the horns, if you will, and take advantage of this past offseason and go into this year, you know, ready to ready to basically hit the ground running and, and see where it takes them. So um, I know I'm excited to see where these guys are at going into next year. Um, like we mentioned, there was ebbs and flows to all these young players games throughout the year. And that's why you, you run into stretches where, uh, you know, you're having trouble winning games because there's going to be uh, youthful mistakes. Yep. But uh, as you continue along, you hope those get minimized and you hope that an off season and another year, uh, you're going to see a lot of growth. So hard, I, again, to really measure where guys are going to be at. But I, I would expect if you don't see a big leap in a player's game, there's some concern. So we'll see. We'll see who uh, is ready to go by the time training camp comes around. And I feel like you kind of mentioned that you, you expect to see consistency, right? Of not the like a guy disappearing for 10, 15 games that that happens, you know, especially rookie seasons. But yeah, being just a more consistent player throughout the season and kind of being there kind of night in, night out. Um, and, you know, again. A lot of these guys going from, you know, 30 or 40 games, maybe like in college or um, and then having to play a full 72 game. It's it's a lot for some of these guys. So um, where do you think the Barracuda need to improve the most uh, next season, whether it's player or whether it's on the eye, like something, whatever it is, penalties, whatever you want to kind of point to. What do you think is the one thing that they the coaching staff needs to focus on or to kind of fix for next year? That's a good question. Um when you're not a playoff team, there's obviously a, a lot of different areas. And, you know, the AHL, it's often uh, we go into every year and it feels like 50 percent of the roster at minimum uh, is different than the year prior. So every year is different. It's always hard to predict uh, who's going to win the division or be one of the best teams in the division. We'll see how free agency shakes out, who comes back, who joins the mix. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for the Barracuda, I'd be intrigued to see. Guys like we saw him at the end of the year, but acquired in that New Jersey trade. A guy like Muka Madul, where is he at next year? What's the expectation? Is is he going to stay again in the AHL next year? Really get his feet wet in North America? Or are they going to maybe expedite the process a little bit because he's a unique player with his size and his skating ability? Um, so just picking out individual players. But um, goaltending is going to be interesting too. Um, where does that stand? Obviously, they yep. just signed a kid from from Russia. I'm assuming he'll come over. Uh, where does McNeemy stand? Um, you know, some of these other guys. Magnus Krona, of course, they just signed yeah, as well. Yep. Krona. So the goaltending position was intriguing last year. It's going to be intriguing again this year. Um, just saw the news with uh, Ben Goodrow. It sounds like he's going to re-enter the draft. So he's no longer in the mix. He's a guy who I thought could potentially be in sandals at the AHL level this year or, or maybe – that, um, you know, fifth goaltender that's playing games in the ECHL, and that's not going to be since it sounds like, again, he's going back into the draft. So we'll see. I mean, I, it's, I, I feel like I'm not quite answering your question, <laughs> but um, it's hard. I'll to really answer it. It's penalties. They got to fix the penalties. That's, well, certainly that's, penalties. You mentioned that, and that was. Uh, <laughs> that's my like, answer. They got to fix the penalties. Really all, all year long. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah, there was some, there was some mean nights where you're just scratching your head. 
on uh, some of the penalties taken. So that's it's hard to overcome. I felt like that was a big uh, Achilles heel all year long. The penalty kill was great at times, but um, when you're killing constantly, you're you know, playing with fire. Guys, yep. Yeah, and guys are sitting on the bench who, who don't play on the penalty kill, and then they aren't playing for, you know, 10-plus minutes, and you just get out of the rhythm of the game. You just felt like so many games this year uh, were impacted by – by penalties, it, it was it, it was almost odd how how much that impacted uh, quite a few of the games this year. So it's a good point. Yeah, penalties certainly, and you're going to have a new group of guys. You're going to have players that are older. Hopefully, they're more disciplined. Yep. Um, you know, they're not reaching. They're moving their feet. All those little things that can make all the difference. So yeah, penalties. Sure, that sounds good to me. If we can clean up the penalties, I'm going to be a lot happier. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, the Barracuda make the playoffs next season if. Good question. Um, well, you know, this year we we struggled to score goals. Um, you know, despite all the talent, uh, we were at the bottom of the league. And I think, you know, nowadays at the NHL level and at the AHL level, it's a little run and gun. You've got to score goals, and you can't just score goals uh, during uh, power play time. So I think the Barracuda, if they can improve their five on five scoring, you hear it all the time um, at the NHL level. Uh, same thing in the American League. If you improve your five on five scoring. You're going to be, uh, you know, if you're one of the better teams, five on five scoring, you're you're going to be a playoff team. So I guess there's there's my answer. They make the playoffs that they can they can score more goals and do it uh, during five on five play. Easier said than done, right? I, I'm, it is I'm easier said than done. Sitting up in the broadcast booth looking at stats, but um, you know, if you if you circle one area, that seems like a a pretty easy solution to improve the group and and try to get in the playoffs. They were close. I mean. Basically, they finished with the the exact same record, more wins actually than Tucson, same amount of points, and uh, they were left out of the dance. But I think next year you, you want to get in the playoffs. You don't want to be one of those final teams where it comes down. No, to you want to kind of solidify yeah, your spot yeah. a lot earlier. Yes. Find a comfortable spot, exactly. Cool. So, all right, guys. Before we finish up with Nick and we start talking about uh, about some of his favorite or least favorite moments from the season, uh, get some rapid fire questions in there. Do need to take a break. Talk to you guys about a uh, game time. We know right now, try to get tickets for all the things that are happening in the summer. You got concerts, you got sporting events, plenty of stuff going on. But buying tickets for your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all your sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. Um, and the thing I love about it is the flash deals. Um, you can get last minute tickets without having to go through a whole process. Literally two clicks, and you can have tickets on your phone ready to go. Great thing about it too is they have pictures of all the seats, right? So there's nothing worse than buying tickets and then you get there and you realize you have a terrible view. You don't have to worry about that with game time. Um, like I said, buy tickets in a matter of seconds and tickets are sent directly to your phone. So you never have to dig through your email and try to find them. Um, so right now, snag tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account. Redeem code locked on NHL for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, um, I want to ask kind of some rapid fire questions here about your, you know, your experience this season. So, uh, which loss bothers you the most that you still think about from this last season? Ooh, ooh, that's a good question. Um, let me think about it real quick. I uh, just off the top of my mind near the end of the year. If I am correct, we were on the road. I think we beat, and forgive me, um, but I think we beat Texas in overtime. This was a back-to-back. -back. Yep. Um, and then I think the following night, yeah, the following yeah. night, uh, we, we had multiple guys go up. We had Kyle Chris Kola get called up, Daniil Gushin. We were very excited because they both played in their uh, first NHL game for the Sharks. For Gushin is first in the NHL. He scored. Chris Kola scored. That was great. But those guys got called up. Um, we had guys basically had never played in the American Hockey League playing in a game. Um, Go out there and have fun, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were, I think we rolled with 10 forwards, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. And basically a game that was a, a must win at that point. It felt like all of them were must win. So just trying to kind of go back on my mind a little bit. That one hurt. And everybody was just kind of, um, you know, disheveled a little bit after the game. Even talked to some of the players. They're just like, man, you know, without without saying it directly, it was it's it's hard to win games when you're rolling basically with ten forwards and you yeah. know guys who've never played in the NHL. So that that was a tough one. That was one of those that just you needed it and um, you just dealt such a tough hand that um, it was hard to overcome 
you know, the circumstances. So that that's one that I guess that kind of sticks out in my mind. For me, it's like the Coachella because like Coachella kind of felt like the older brother, right? Where it was like beginning of the season, they just beat the brakes off the Cuda, and like by the end of the season, it was like okay, we're we're playing with these guys, but like they always is like we get to overtime, and then like Coachella would like would win in overtime. It's like one of those games. If well, you get one of those games and just kind of like yeah, because Coachella is really good. They you know um, yeah that the Coachella ones always bother me the most. So all right, uh, favorite goal of the season for you. Favorite goal? Um, that is a great question. Um, let me think. Give me, mine's give me easy. A, mine's uh, easy. It's the it's the Gushin, uh third times a charm goal in overtime. Oh yeah, that was a pretty. That was a great goal. Um, another goal um, is I'm gonna while I'm talking to him, I'm gonna <laughs> just trying to refresh my memory. Um, we had a goal in the season in overtime by Patrick Seeloff. That, that, that was, was a good Patrick one too. Goal. I hadn't scored a, I, mean, I think it was his first goal of the year. Yeah. His, his first goal of the year. He had played in Germany the year before. So it's kind of like an asterisk, yeah. but he hadn't scored in the league in a couple of years. Um, all year long. He was like, I gotta get, I gotta get one. I gotta get one. I gotta get one. And you could tell he was, it was starting to, you know, it was getting in his mind a little bit. He's not a goal scorer. That's not really his role, but um, mm-hmm. he wanted to get one, right? One, right. For him to score in overtime in the fashion he did was was incredible. And the way that everybody spilled over the the, the bench and, and went to greet him was pretty cool. Kind of gave you a, a real idea of what he meant to the team. Yeah, that was that was a good one, too. You know, shooter, shoot, man. Uh, Patrick Seedolf, <laughs> shooter. Uh, all right. What was your favorite road trip of the season? Favorite road trip? Um, it's a good question. Well, we played within the division basically all year. We played uh, we played outside mm-hmm. Texas and Iowa. But going up to Calgary was pretty cool. Um, first time I'd been up there since I was, I was nine, maybe, um, when I was playing youth hockey as a kid. The last time I went up to Calgary. So that was cool. I'd never been to the Saddle Dome. Um, you know, they're going to tear that building down the next couple of years as they got approval for a new barn. So I think it's due. Um, it's definitely older, <laughs> but it's cool. It's almost like an oversized junior uh, barn. It was it was pretty cool to kind of experience that, and going up to Canada is always fun because it's just so hockey driven and, mm-hmm. and hockey crazed. It's on every TV. There's 50 TSN stations with hockey nonstop. It's pretty cool just to immerse yourself in it. So um, I think Calgary was was one of the one of the highlights this year. All right, uh, your favorite themed home game like Teddy Bear Toss or Pucks for Paws. Which one is your favorite one? That's a great question. I really enjoyed, and this is something we hadn't done before, but our country night. Um, we had done a country night, but we never did a concert. So, yeah. And uh, we gave away like styrofoam type hats. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Dumb and Dumber. And uh, one of the scenes when, he, Dumb when Dumb, he walks in the big hat, yeah. He sudden, he, somehow he got some money. I forget that. I forget yeah. how it came a, a Maybe because he sold his his bird. Yeah. Um, but he's got that big hat on, and that just reminded him of these styrofoam hats. So I thought that was hilarious. Um, and that was just a fun night. We had a great crowd. The post game concert I thought was a total success. So um, that's one of the the games that really stuck out to me. But like Teddy Bear Toss is classic, right? It's just it's it's such mm-hmm. a junior and uh, minor pro staple. So that's always fun. But uh, for me individually, I would say our our um, true to country night was was a highlight of the year for me. All right, um, your favorite food item at TechCU. It's a good question. I don't really eat the food there because I'm usually running up to the You're booth. Busy. <laughs> we, have a, we have a media meal that they provide. So yeah, I haven't. Sometimes I wish I could just go down and like, go wander yeah. the game as a fan. Um, you know, before I got the the job with the Barracuda seven years ago, I had been one AHL game in my life. I was working in minor league baseball, and uh, I was like, I want to go. I want to go to a game. It was like an hour outside of where I was at, but the Charlotte Checkers were taking on the. Uh, the Rockford Ice Hogs, mm. and it was when the team Charlotte was playing before they had moved to to where they play now, which is Bojangles Coliseum, which is an older arena. They played uh, where the basketball team played, so um, they had the top tarped off, and it was a great crowd. It actually happened to be a uh, a uh, one of the dog games, so there was dogs in attendance. And, oh man! <laughs> uh, but besides that, I've never been to a AHL game simply as a fan. So. One day, hopefully, you know, cross our fingers, the long term goal for any broadcasters get to the highest level. So one day, if I if I'm lucky enough to to move up in this profession, then I'll have to come back as a fan and I can enjoy all the uh, all the food items and all the beverage items too um, that there is to offer. So sorry, I can't really answer the question because I haven't eaten the food. 
Uh, the answer is the uh, the Korean barbecue nachos. That's okay. the answer. So uh, that okay. and so my kids like I take my kids to a bajillion sharks games and I took them to Cuda games this year and they are always like we want to go back to the Cuda game. We want to go back to the Cuda game. So uh, yeah, if go to Texas, you bring the kids. Yeah, good yeah. recommendation. Yes, they are. They are, but yeah, the uh, the barbecue uh, nachos, uh, uh, Korean barbecue nachos. Okay, um, we know, of course, the Cuda are hosting the AHL All Star Game. I want to get your way, way, way too early pick on who is going to represent the Cuda um, at the uh, for the AHL All Star. Um, let's go, uh, Daniil Gushin. Uh, mm. He's still with the club. I think you know they, at least the comments that we heard last year were that. He was, you know, going to continue to develop, and I think the Sharks are they're playing the long game here with all their prospects, which yes. is uh, I think no, rush. Well. no, no rush, no need to rush. <laughs> to them. Um, he'll get games next year. There's no question, but I, I would, you know, expect him to be predominantly in the AHL, and if he can hit the ground running like he finished last year, um, he was scoring in bunches at the end of the year. So if he can continue that, and often All Star voting is based off points. A lot of these teams you don't see, so when you vote and yep. you know, voting is had, it's often based off points. So if he's able to start the year the way that he uh, finished last year, um, you know, he'll be right in that conversation. And of course, the All-Star game's halfway through the year. So it's, you know, first half of the season is where it's uh, voted on. So we'll go, we'll go Gushin. It's a pretty safe pick. I, yeah, Gushin. I, I would go Gushin or Robbins. Those are my two. Uh, but yeah, I think Gushin, would, especially if he, uh, like you said, if he gets off scoring some goals, uh, yeah, I think he might be, it might be a lock for that. So uh, last question, Nick. Off season plans. What do you got? What do you got coming up before before the draft and uh, uh, development camp? Well, it's uh, you know it's a lot of R and R. I mean, I always I just need to refresh my mind. It's uh, I love my job. It's an absolute blast. But during the season, it's, it's about a grind. Seven, <laughs> uh, it's a seventh month uh, seven month sprint basically, where you just don't have uh, much time uh, mm-hmm. for family and friends. So it's a great opportunity off season always to catch up with everybody. But uh, me and the wife just booked a booked a trip to Hawaii. So we're going to go to Hawaii in August. And um, I've got a twin brother too, and he's getting married this summer. Oh, there so you go. looking forward to that. He'll, uh, he'll be getting married in Truckee. So we've got a trip to Truckee. We've got his bachelor party coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, we've got lots of things on the dock. We'll see if anything else gets sprinkled in there. But yeah, just relaxing and you know, getting ready for, we've got the draft coming up and, um, of course, in development camp. And I'm, I'm always involved in some form or fashion with that stuff. So um, we'll have a little bit of hockey sprinkled in there as well. But, um, yeah, those are my plans. I expect to see a very nice tan uh, in September for you. Then. Well, you know, I'm looking <laughs> I, my goal every year, and it's an impossible goal, but it's something I, I try to set every year. I want to come back when the new year starts and have a Randy Hahn-esque tan. When Randy Hahn comes back after the offseason, there's nobody – who's got a better rich tan than Randy Hahn. So that's always the goal. Um, obviously, as you can tell by my my complexion, that is uh, impossible, but we try our best. I come back a little bit more red. So um, something, I got to have some color because that seven month stretch where we're playing hockey, I don't see the sun too often. And it's always a, it's a tough, uh, no. it's a tough reality when the season ends. And then I start making my way outside and I'm trying to, you know, just, get a little sun. Just that. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. So some sort of tan. I've got to have something or I didn't have a didn't have a good summer. I'm as, I'm assuming Randy's already in the gym, and by gym I mean he's already outside getting his. Uh, okay. Yeah, you gotta you gotta you gotta catch up. He's That's he's right. day one. The off season yeah, plan is already yes. going. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Nick, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure we'll have you back on uh, to when the season gets a little bit closer to to talk some more Barracuda hockey. Uh, where can the people find you, buddy? Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not the biggest tweeter, to be honest, but I am on social media at uh, Nick, N-I-C-K, Nolan, uh, N-O-L-L-E-N. So you can find I'm going to say you don't follow me. I I do see that, buddy. Oh, oh okay. That just sums I, up my social media involvement mm-hmm. that, that I'm not even aware of that. So I will give you a follow. It's, it's okay. I see it. It's okay. So, but no, I'm Nick Nolan. That way. I'm old school. I, I mean, I, I like social media to a degree. Um, it's mandatory in our field, but... Um, I'm on it way too much. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so forgive me, forgive me. I'll give you a follow. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, you always have your blogs that you the Noli Noli's uh, notes that come out as well on, on the sjbarracuda.com. And you know, I'm sure we'll hear from you here soon. So uh, enjoy the rest of your summer, buddy. Some of All us right. are going to be still cranking out the content. You know, <laughs> it does. It never ends. Here, it never so. ends for any of us. So. It's well, it's all year long. Well, uh, appreciate you having me, and look forward to talking to you next time.
All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Nick. Um, like I said, we're going to be doing CUDA week, so make sure you guys are back tomorrow. If you want to be an everyday or just come back tomorrow, we're going to be digging into the start with uh, the forwards. Um, this might be a two-part episode, so we'll see, but i uh, going to be starting with the forwards tomorrow. Kind of guys like William Eklund, Thomas Borlo, looking at how their season was and then what is next for all these guys, because I think that's the big piece, right? It's kind of the expectations for next season going forward. Um, so we're going to be doing that. All you have to do is just follow along wherever you get podcasts or you can subscribe on YouTube as well. So, um, but the Barracuda this season, you know, I think disappointing was a little bit, but I expect a much more consistent Barracuda team, especially with guys like uh, Gushin and Robbins and Ozzy and Co. Kind of these next guys in that year two, where you really, really see just more, like we talked about with Nick, more of a consistent, right? Less, hopefully less streaky, where you got guys, you know, going hot for, you know, 10 to 15 games and then disappearing. You want to see those guys be more and more consistent. I think we're going to see that um, going into next year and especially in two, year two of a coaching staff as they try to kind of figure things out as well. So um, thanks again to Nick. Thanks again to the San Jose Barracuda. Always, always accommodating for anything I ask. Uh, continue to be just just absolute buttes over there uh the the cuda so um like i said be back tomorrow with with more more cuda as we continue to to dig through the cuda season that was this this uh week have another draft profile coming up for you guys as well probably wednesday or thursday uh most likely wednesday uh for that one so and yeah um be back tomorrow make sure you guys are following along wherever you get podcasts um you can follow the show on twitter facebook and instagram at locked on sharks you can follow me on twitter at my fry hole and until tomorrow, bye, friends.